Now part of the Darkcast Network. Welcome to Indie Podcasts with a Dark Side. In a shocking case of unexpected violence, I tell you the complex case of a wife, mother, and stepmother who isn't at all what she seems. It's the case of Sylvia White, right now on Love and Murder. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong, where our motto is, you're either someone's last love or their first murder. I am your host, Kai, and in today's episode, we're discussing a twisted case of narcissism and psychopathy. Just when you think it's over, it's not. Listen all the way to the end for the sharp left turn this one takes. Before we begin, I want to say this episode is sponsored by my lambs and Patreon. I want to thank you, as always, for your support. Be sure to subscribe to Love and Murder right now while you're listening so you don't miss a case. If you didn't know, you can also subscribe on our Patreon so that you don't have to hear intros such as this one or the commercials that are coming up. And you'll be a sponsor of Love and Murder. Also, you will have my heartfelt thanks. Don't forget that in Patreon, we now have the daily Kai Rant segment in there. Patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And I'll talk more about Patreon after the show. In the meantime, though, grab your butts, grab your apple juice, and let's get into some love and murder. On January 21st, 1994, in the wee hours of the morning, wife Sylvia Ipoch White called police to report her husband, a 59-year-old Kinston, North Carolina insurance agent, Billy Carlisle White, missing. Billy always strove for the best, and he worked his way up in the insurance business in the late 1960s. He started out knocking on doors of his town to now being salesman of the year. Billy was described as an outgoing community leader and a person who helped found the exchange club and served on the community. Sylvia frequently volunteered with the disabled at hospitals and was described as being sweet-spoken. On the surface, the family appeared to be a very happy, well-adjusted family. Now, after this 911 call, when police arrived, they asked Sylvia what happened, and she said that Bill had gone to sell an insurance policy to someone named Tim Connor, but he never came back. Sheriff Billy Smith knew something was wrong. He knew Bill and knew that he wouldn't stay out all night. They started a search party, and in the late afternoon of the same day, a search plane spotted his burgundy Chevrolet Lumina van on a logging road that was 12 miles south of Kinston. They also saw something laying beside the van, but they couldn't make it out from this high altitude. When ground support arrived at the location, they saw Billy laying by the van, dead, shot twice. What was he doing in such a remote location, and who could have killed him anyway? And why? He had no enemies, and he was just an insurance salesman. That's not really something that accumulates enemies. In the small town, this gruesome murder scared the residents, but they also immediately thought about Billy's wife, Sylvia, and gathered around her in consoling support. Quote, the whole town babysat her, me included. This was a quote from her stepdaughter, Teresa White Murray, who was 38 at the time. Police once again asked Sylvia what happened, and she said that Billy had gone out of town to meet a client. She said Tim had called before Billy left with instructions on where Billy would be meeting him. That night, Sylvia had gone to a cosmetic seminar at the Sheraton in Kinston. Since Billy was going that way, he stopped by to see her on the way to his appointment. And that's all she knew. Now, although the town felt bad for Sylvia, her immediate family looked at her out of the corner of their eye. In my opinion, if your family is looking at you some type of way, I'm more inclined to speak with them to find out why. One day, an informant spoke to the police and gave them a different story than Sylvia had given them. He said a 40-year-old carpenter named James Linward Taylor showed him Billy White's photo six months ago and said that he'd been offered $20,000 and a van to kill him. So investigators were like, interesting. And they went and found this James Taylor. James came into the station and started singing like a bird. He said this woman, Sylvia White, approached him in the summer of 1991 and propositioned him to kill her husband. She had been having an affair and wanted her husband's money and $200,000 in life insurance. 
James told his uncle, he was like, oh, look, we have a job. I mean, $20,000 in a van. He was like, Uncle Ernest Basden, you want to go ahead and do it? And his uncle said, um, no. However, when Sylvia asked again sometime around New Year's, James and Ernest said, okay, because they had fallen into some money issues. And apparently money was more important to them than morals. So now the plan went as such. James was supposed to act as Tim Connor, but the only kink in the plan was who would believe that someone wanted to meet on a deserted logging road to buy insurance. Sylvia calmed his nerves by telling him that, look, Billy's greedy AF and he's going to show up. He would do, quote, anything to sell a policy. What's an asshole? Her, not him. How she's just callously talking about him like this. On that night, sure enough, Billy showed up. James introduced himself as Tim Connor and then told Billy that he needed to go pee. When James stepped away in the guise of going off to pee, his uncle Ernest shot Billy, one time from about six feet away, which is 1.8 meters. And after Billy fell to the ground, Ernest shot him again. James also told police that while she was trying to recruit him to murder her husband, she said, quote, it's not that hard to do. I had a stepchild. I put a bag over it until it stopped breathing. Wait, what? In continuing the investigation and speaking with everyone who had been around the family, investigators found out that a week after Billy's funeral, his daughter Teresa had stopped by the house to check up on her stepmother. When she got there, she saw she was talking to a scruffy looking man with a chain belt and a long ponytail. I mean, of course she thought nothing of it, but investigators knew this had described James. In speaking to her neighbors, they described Sylvia as a hyperactive person and a compulsive cleaner. Jeannie Bannister said, quote, it almost made you nervous to be around her. Woody Taylor, Sylvia's first husband, no relation to James, said her personality traits may have come from when she was a child and she was in a, an orphanage after her mother died. He said that they ended up getting married in 1953 after she became pregnant. Quote, she was a beautiful young girl, brunette, well-proportioned with hazel or green eyes. However, 16 months after they married, they separated. Though her marriage to Billy seemed happy to outsiders, family and neighbors said that it wasn't always that way. According to one of his sons, Steve, Billy drank a lot and Sylvia constantly fought with him about it. She would say that she was leaving him and then he would lie in the driveway so that she couldn't drive off. A few years before he died, she'd given him an ultimatum. Stop drinking or I am leaving. Even if you're in front of the car, I will find a way to get around you. I will walk if I have to. I will take a bus. He quit drinking then and there. And over the last year, they seemed the happiest they had ever been. They bought a new house and in December sent the children a framed photo of the two of them together. Something that actually hadn't happened in years. On February 13th, 1992, investigators charged Sylvia and James with first degree murder. On February 14th, they arrested Ernest. Sylvia's attorney said at the time not to put your eggs, quote, on the words of a confessed killer, meaning basically don't trust James. He's obviously a killer and Sylvia is just a sweet lady. Now, this is where it gets even more twisted. Hey, lambs, Cliffhanger Kai's here. Dive into a world of stories with audiobooks. Audiobooks is your passport to a vast library of thrilling mysteries, steamy romances, and captivating bestsellers. With thousands of titles at your fingertips, you can stream or download your favorite books anytime, anywhere. And here's the best part. As a special treat to our listeners, sign up through my exclusive link at murderandlove.com forward slash recommends forward slash audiobooks and get ready for a 30-day free trial and three free audiobooks. Immerse yourself in stories that move you. Head to murderandlove.com forward slash recommends forward slash audiobooks and start your reading adventure today. Audiobooks.com, where every story comes to life. It's easier than typing in that long link. You can just click on my link in the show notes below and get started today. You know, one thing I know is that my lambs are smart. So I know y'all are smart shoppers as well. Ready to supercharge your savings? Rakuten's got you covered. 
Rakuten, the go-to spot for incredible deals, cash back, and more. Join now through my exclusive link at murderandlove.com forward slash recommends forward slash Rakuten and score a fabulous $40 cash back bonus after spending $40 or more just for signing up. But act fast, this amazing offer ends in just three days on November 16th. Why Rakuten? It's your ticket to earning cash back on the things that you're already buying with fantastic deals at your favorite stores. Don't miss out on your $40 cash back. Sign up today at murderandlove.com forward slash recommends forward slash Rakuten. Rakuten, because shopping smarter means more savings. And instead of typing in that long URL, just click on the link in my show notes below before Thursday, November 16th, start shopping and get your $40. And now back to the show. Police hadn't forgotten what James had said about Sylvia's stepson. So they spoke with family and friends. Leslie White, Billy's brother, told police, quote, it's mighty suspicious for a youngin to choke on plastic. What's he talking about? Let's get into that. When Bill and Sylvia got married, both of them had been previously divorced. At the time, Sylvia had three kids and Bill had four. This included his namesake, his namesake, the baby, four-year-old little Bill. Everyone, friends and family, said that Sylvia ignored the crap out of little Bill. Quote, the little boy was scared of her every time he came out here. If he did the least little something like he was eating or sitting at the table and he turned over a glass or spilled something, he would go crying and hollering, don't tell mama, don't tell mama. One day in 1973, people saw that little Bill's legs and arms had been burnt. When they asked about it, Sylvia said that he had burned them on a gas grill while she wasn't watching. Then on June 21st, 1973, a year and a half after Sylvia and Bill were married, little Bill tragically died. Sylvia said that she'd left him in the living room and he ended up swallowing part of a dry cleaning bag. You know, those plastic bags that goes over your dry cleaning. I don't know if they do that in other countries, but in the United States, when you get a dry cleaning, they have like this see-through, very thin plastic bag that goes over your dry cleaning. And then you have the hanger that hangs all of it up. So that plastic bag she's talking about. She rushed him to the hospital and told nurses that he had swallowed a piece of plastic and then became unresponsive. Nurses couldn't find the plastic and little Bill ended up dying. A coroner looked over the body, found the plastic in his throat and reported that little Bill appeared to have accidentally choked to death. Even though Bill's family and little Bill's brothers were suspicious, they never went to police. Quote, it was kind of funny that anytime anything happened, she was the only one there. It wasn't something we could come right out and say, but there was always a suspicion in our heads. So fast forward. And now the family's talking to the police about their concern after James had mentioned that. So little Bill's body was exhumed on July 16th, 1994 for an autopsy. The state medical examiner, Dr. John Butts, reported that a child that young in age couldn't force such a big piece of plastic so far down his throat. Quote, the plastic was described as approximately three inches wide by 10 to 12 inches in length. The body also showed other evidence of physical abuse. Quote, we found a four inch crack in the skull that indicated that at some point prior to his death, he had received a blow to that area, a crack in his skull. When investigators went to the hospital to speak with the doctor and nurse who had attended to little bill quote, he looked over at us and he said, I knew you'd be coming here. Those were his first words. And this was a quote from Sherry Smith. A friend of Bill's and the hospital's operating room manager, Anita McGirt, testified that the plastic was tightly wadded up in the boy's throat, but that it unfolded like a flower once removed. Peggy Crisco and Susan Mannon, who the nurses who treated little Bill, also described what they saw. Peggy testified that the plastic was large enough to cover her hand and three-fourths of her arm. Oh my God, that's big. I mean, I guess they, they described it in inches, but I didn't really think about it like that. So it was large enough to cover her hand and three quarters of her arm. There were no torn edges, no teeth marks or bite or chew marks on the plastic. 
When the medical examiner took it out of the boy's throat, he handed it to nurse Susan and she threw it in the sink. The piece of plastic was later thrown away as trash. Nurse Susan testified at trial that the piece of plastic was too large to have been swallowed by a human being, much less a four-year-old child. And Nurse Peggy testified that the piece of plastic could not have been swallowed accidentally. The medical examiner had ruled Little Bill's death as an accident, and in the emergency room records, it didn't even show that there was anything about plastic found in Little Bill's throat. However, the nurses and the doctor remained suspicious, but they had to follow what their supervisor said at the time. Friends and family testified that over the years, Sylvia's story about his death changed over and over and over again. She said the night after he died, she had told the grandparents that she had gone to the garage to look for some string beans, and when she got back, that's when she found him choking. Then years later, she said that the little boy liked to pull plastic from the dry cleaning bags and then pretend it was chewing gum. Then she said that on the morning of his death, She had taken the plastic out of his mouth and then went to another room to get dressed. And when she got back, that's when she saw his head was on the table. He was choking. She said she tried to remove the plastic from his throat, but could not. This was three different stories already. It was also recorded that before little Bill died, Sylvia had taken out a $15,000 life insurance policy on him. Wow. The family told the police another piece of news that they weren't aware of. In 1959, Sylvia had married a man named Leslie Ipoch, her second husband. Two of her boys were with this marriage. In 1967, when he was 32, Leslie died. Well, according to Sylvia, he committed suicide. He shot himself in the temple and police found him dead in bed with a bullet in his head and the gun by his side. They ruled it a suicide. But now looking back... Was it really? His family said that Sylvia told them that she'd been sleeping in a separate bedroom that night and that he had been depressed about his health. He had complained about numbness in his fingers and legs and had been to the hospital. That was enough for him to kill himself? Some of his eight siblings, eight of them, were not convinced. One of his brothers, Norman Ipoch, is quoted as saying, quote, I had a feeling something fishy was going on. Things didn't ever shape up too well. I couldn't say nothing while mama and daddy were living. I don't think he would have wanted to kill himself. During the trial, the entire story of how Bill was killed came out. He was shot with a shotgun, but when Ernest initially went to shoot him, the gun didn't fire because Ernest had forgotten to cock the hammer back. So can you imagine Billy turning around and seeing what was about to happen? That's when Ernest cocked the hammer and shot him in the stomach with a shotgun from six feet away. Ernest then took out the spent casing, loaded another one, walked over to Billy, stood over him, and shot him again. For this job, James gave him $300. That was it. He did that for $300. Not that I'm saying there's any price to put on killing somebody. I'm just saying, seriously? On September 28th, 1992, for the murder of her stepson, Little Bill, a grand jury indicted Sylvia for first degree murder. So she received a life sentence for that. So she had received a life sentence for killing Billy. Now she got another life sentence for Little Bill. So now she has two life sentences to be served consecutively and 10 years for conspiracy. On April 9th, 1993, Ernest was sentenced to death because he was the one who pulled the trigger. James was sentenced to 30 years because he took a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. Throughout all of this, Sylvia maintained her innocence, of course, because all of the freaking evidence is all circumstantial. However, the part that is circumstantial is that no one could prove that she'd actually killed Leslie. However, a lot of things didn't add up. For instance, quote, he was right-handed, but the gun was in his left hand. She got away with that. She killed three people. This quote comes from author Suzanne Barr, who wrote a book called Fatal Kiss about Sylvia's criminal career. After Sylvia was sentenced, little Bill's sister is quoted as saying, quote, I was glad. I wanted it answered. I wanted to know you can only get hurt so much. Get the cards out on the table and let's play them all right now. 
She's real ill-natured, short-tempered. One moment you could be talking, she'd be fine. The next, she'd explode. On December 6, 2022, Ernest was executed by lethal injection. He didn't request anything special for his last meal. Uh, instead, he chose what everyone was eating that Thursday night, which was breaded veal, mashed potatoes, brown gravy, three bean salad, slices of bread, mixed vegetable, an orange and fruit and fruit punch. His final words were, quote, I killed Billy White. I'm sorry for it. And I pray that his family will come to forgive me and let time heal their wounds. And that's all we can do. On December 29th, 2021, after eight parole hearings, Sylvia White was granted parole. What? Of course, the family had been fighting the parole ever since she was up for it in 2005. In 2018, Teresa said that she felt like she never got the chance to properly grieve her losses. She said that without a doubt that if her former stepmother was released, she would definitely kill again. Quote, I hope she doesn't get out because someone else will lose their life. It might be you, your brother or your dad. She needs to rot in there. In 2020, Teresa died of pancreatic cancer at the age of 66. In 2021, the court granted Sylvia's parole. 11 months later, on December 2nd, 2022, the then 85-year-old Sylvia was released from prison. I honestly can't believe that. She definitely killed two people, including a four-year-old, and allegedly killed one more, and she gets release? On what grounds did any of that make sense? Is it because she was 85, so you think she can't kill again? And what was all this two life sentences and an additional 10 years about then? Like, for show? Like, why even, why do that? Oh my God, I, I want to hear from you. I want to hear your thoughts on this. James is still in prison at the Minimum Security Weight Correctional Center in Raleigh. Also, this case will continue on in Patreon. I have some extras that I wanted to talk about. So if you want to hear that, come on over and join us in Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash 11 murder. So what did you think about this case? Did y'all peep how she talked about her stepson? I Like, I didn't want to gloss over that. Did y'all hear how she talked about her stepson? Quote, I put a bag over it until it stopped breathing. What? So she just dehumanized the little boy, just called him an it. Wow. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. And as usual, you have three ways of sharing them with me. Number one, you could tell me in the comments below. And as you know, every other Saturday I go through your comments. So that's this Saturday coming up. So if you want to ha have your comments heard, then either leave it in the comments below or join the Lamb Facebook group. You can get the links to that in the show notes below as well. Or you can join my personal preference, <laughs> the exclusive Lamb community here at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Right now, we have options starting at only $3 a month donation. If you join Patreon, you get commercial free episodes. So this episode minus all the commercials, minus the intro, and you get all the additions to this case. So like pictures, videos, pictures of evidence, court documents, and the extras that I'm adding, I'm recording the, uh, another ending to this episode. So you'll actually get another ending and a longer episode to this episode. You also get access to the daily Kai Rants that's also in our Patreon now. All that for the $3 a month donation. However, the best tier is $5 and above because not only do you get these things, but you also get some bonuses like bonus episodes, access to everything that I post throughout the web. You get to hear about my life, see pictures of what I'm doing. So just, you know, get to know the whole stuff like that. So all of this in our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And an easy and free way to help me out is by simply sharing this episode. Hit that share button right now while we're talking and share with your friends. Share with your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters. Share with your friends, share on your social media. Share, 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 share. And as always, I end each episode by reminding you that it's all love and no murder, y'all. Bye. Hey. 
real quick, please don't forget to go ahead and leave me a five-star review right now on whatever platform you're listening on. It really does help other people to find the show and it helps bring me up on the charts and the platform you're on. So please just go in there, leave five-star review. You can say whatever you want in the description. It will definitely help me out. And I'm going to say thank you beforehand.